Song for a Soldier, 1920 Emmett's heart was cast at Claudine's feet the moment we first walked into her salon. Located in a poorer suburb of Paris, she swept the simple room as we came in from the rain. Her dark hair stylishly cropped just below her chin. A silver butterfly hairpin framed her face. Her skirt ended at her knees in this new era's fashion. She looked to us with enchantingly dark eyes. If I had been attracted to women, Claudine would have been the most beautiful woman I ever met. No wonder Emmett tripped when he first saw her. I launched myself forward to keep him from falling and hurting himself. When Claudine saw us, I had grabbed Emmett around his waist to hold him up. Initially, she thought Emmett and I were a couple because we arrived together at her boarding house. I had, without thinking, said that one room would suffice for us both. Emmett didn't care about sharing a bed with me. One room was cheaper. He didn't want my body, nor did I want his. Emmett had been used to sharing his bed besides. He and his sister shared a bed before he ran off to join the war. That sounds odd until I remembered that Emmett's body wasn't like mine. People in his village thought that he had been born a particularly unusual girl. He and his sister were twins and went everywhere together. She inherited all of the beauty their poor family had, while Emmett appeared more humble. Emmett was more like my kid brother than anything else. We'd whisper stories in the dark to each other, if neither of us could sleep. The war was something we had been forced to share, but, but Emmett insisted he wouldn't be a war victim. He wanted to live as beautiful a life as possible. He wanted me to live a beautiful life, too. He longed to hear my hopes and dreams, so I eagerly poured them out to fill the night's empty silence. His snoring tells me that he was lucky tonight. Emmett's mind decided to give him mercy and grant him sleep. He's so young, but unbearably tired. There are dark lines under his eyes that will never leave his face, marking years of sleepless nights. I have these lines, too. Curiously enough, we are young old men. Sleep well, Emmett, say softly. Cheval also snores from the foot of our bed. The dust-colored ratter still follows Emmett. I'm comforted that Cheval will also enjoy a peaceful retirement among friends. He is a scruffy little dog, but his spirit made him beautiful. Cheval and Emmett mirror each other in that way. Their inner toughness allowed them to survive the war. I find Emmett's worn copy of Cherie left on the sofa by the window. On days when his leg bothered him, he'd sit or lie on that sofa and read. Claudine would often sit with Emmett to keep him company. She would bring a book of her own to quietly read. Once he became aware of Claudine's presence, he abandoned his book, no longer able to concentrate. There from that sofa, Emmett delivered the final message of Claudine's first husband. He had been with Captain Dupont when he died. Emmett had been asked to go to Paris to find Claudine. Feeling his own impending death, the captain begged Emmett to give Claudine his farewell as he bled out from the bullet of a German sniper. His luck ran out on that cold day in November 1917. Captain Augustin Dupont lay dying with Private Emmett Bourgogne holding onto his hand as bullets sailed over their heads. Emmett was the last man to see Claudine's husband alive, and alone knew his dying words. Tell Claudine that she is among the most extraordinary women. She gave me strength and courage through this long, dark night. She mustn't mourn for me the rest of her life. She needs to remember to live. Her life doesn't end with mine. We shall meet in heaven when it's all over. Claudine cried bitterly for her fallen husband, for most of their marriage he fought the enemy from the trenches. They spent a month together before he was called to war. From their boarding house she wrote him letters, and did her best to distract him with stories and encourage him with reassurances. She loved him from that great distance. Poor Augustine! He was born to be a soldier, and he died a soldier. Tears glistened in her eyes as she spoke. Fate chose Emmett to release Claudine from this awful waiting. Our captain loved Claudine. He had wished her a good life, even as his own was trickling slowly away. This made me admire him all the more, even sorrier to hear how he had died so painfully. I'm grateful to you, Emmett. 
glad my husband didn't have to die alone. You are a loyal friend. Knowing this has brought me more comfort than you will ever know. Claudine dried her eyes and reached out to take Emmett's hands in her own. He shyly looked to her hands, then into her lovely eyes. Of course, madame, it was my honor. I promised Captain Dupont that if I lived to see the end of the war, I would find you and tell you what I knew. Claudine gently squeezed Emmett's hands as he spoke. She kissed Emmett's cheek and thanked him again before she went off to make tea. Emmett blushed a bright red. I see why Captain Dupont loved Claudine. In the photographs she is lovely, but in life she is so much more. Oh, Thomas, I like everything about her, he confessed sweetly to me. The world had aligned in such a way that Claudine saw Emmett in a proper light. Only Emmett could have comforted her with those words in the return of the captain's medal and her photograph. Claudine learned Emmett kept his word. Unintentionally, Emmett made a strong recommendation of his character and deeply moved her. I was not surprised that Claudine soon turned to Emmett for comfort. He found more peace lying with her than he did by my side. Claudine softly caressed or kissed him, and he returned her embraces. She didn't want to rush him, and he didn't want to push himself on her. He wanted to be gentlemanly for her. The sparks between them ignited into something far warmer than any respectable friendship. They grew bolder, and Emmett's former insecurity all but vanished. I had never seen Emmett so happy. He was high on Claudine's indulgent love for him. His life had been so hard before now, and easily could go back to being difficult. But in Claudine's care, he shined in a way which I never thought possible for him. It pleased her that he flourished, happily cooking, singing, and even dancing with her. He could dance with her if he held on to her tightly while they were on the dance floor together. He couldn't do any of those complex country dances any more, nor the newer ones where everyone was kicking and flailing madly about. Claudine held him, and they gently swayed to the piano music like they were two trees in the same light breeze. She wouldn't let him fall down. Claudine held Emmett up so he could put his crutches aside. I watched them dance. They would do everything their own way. Claudine was herself a rare woman. She hadn't married Emmett for his money. He could barely live on what he had. Grateful civilians had given him things and thanks for his service, since they knew finding a stable job would be next to impossible in his condition. After all Emmett had suffered, he deserved to live peacefully with someone who valued him. I came down from a card game upstairs to see Claudine sitting on the sofa, reading. Emmett napped with his head in her lap. She stroked his hair gently like he was a cat. The rest of his body was stretched out across the sofa. His shirt, trousers, and suspenders were all new. His one foot rested on the arm of the sofa. Claudine still had enough room to sit, because Emmett was a small man. He was smaller than I was in stature, but his shoulders were wider than mine, his middle thicker. He had gained weight since we were no longer on starvation rations. Claudine could afford to feed him, and she fed him well. I wanted what he had, but with a man. My best friend became a happy husband. I felt a great happiness for him, but a deep sadness for myself. I mourned the loss of Emmett to Claudine. This seemed only natural to me. When, I wondered, would it be my turn?